I had my 96 year old mom with me for six years. So I was already a caregiver when he became ill. I had a friend that was in the hospital because I was at work coming back and forth and she was my gatekeeper. So when somebody stayed too long, she said, no, it's time for you to go exactly. now. And I think you need friends like that. There was a point in time when he crawled into bed and decided that he didn't care anymore and he was just gonna die. He spent two years laying in that bed. I'm like, mom, we need to step back. Yes. Step back, one thing at a time, okay? Yeah. We will get it figured out. Oh, this has been <laughs> invaluable. Oh, this is important too, laughing. Some of the strategies that caregivers can be taught are that they can really take stock of the environment, see how their home environment or other environments that the person is engaging in are supportive of that person's ability. They need to be able to gauge from the person how they're doing on a given day. Is this a good day or a bad day? And to become more observant, a little bit more clinical in their role. We get ready for bed and I put the TV on mute and she goes through, how do I feel? Are you sure, are you lying to me? <laughs> do you have any aches <laughs> you know, or pains? How's your stomach today? Every, you know, it's like, night. I just wanna know, you know, what's going on. <laughs> they can really assess day to day, or even morning to night, how that person is managing, so that then they can help monitor and maybe adapt their expectations or the routine of the day. Um, based on how the person is, is doing. It's uh, valuable to ask them how they're doing, but put it in terms of some measurable. On a scale of one to 10, do you have a lot of pain? Or on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? It helps to know what they're thinking instead of assuming you know what they're thinking. Maybe they just want to be left alone. The encephalopathy, the cognitive confusion that can occur with liver disease may be episodic, it may be a low level and kind of chronic, um, and I think that it's important for caregivers to learn and, and to really have some skill at observing and documenting. Many caregivers talk about keeping notes about their person's behavior, and this can be very, very helpful in terms of recognizing a pattern. Um, rather than always being in a reactive mode to the behavior changes of the patient. And then that can be valuable information to relay to the medical team. I've really been able to see the deterioration of myself and the personality changes that I've gone, gone through um, when I've had loose enough moments to be able to do that. But that's the hardest part. And it's got to be hard for somebody else, especially people that love you, to watch you deteriorate in front of your eyes. Another strategy that's really important for caregivers to be supported in and, and even trained in is how to keep their involvement person-centered. They don't want to manage the person. They really want to help the person who's ill manage the disease. And it's very important to take the person's requests and preferences and ways of being when they were well and before the illness really did take such a prominent role, to really keep that in mind and try to keep that as much a part of daily life as possible. After he came home, I was, I can't leave, I don't want to go to work, I'm caught. If you take a nap, you have to call me. That's what I would tell him because, and then when you wake up, you have to call me. And I've relaxed on a lot of those things. I think it's important to take control without being controlling and a, a lot of that will depend on the, the condition of the patient at that time. They're, they're under a lot of stress. They're fighting for their life in some cases. They're on medications that will slow them down or alter the way they're thinking. And their goal is to get through the day. So you can watch that. You can encourage them to uh, do as much as possible on their own. I couldn't make him do anything. I mean, there were times where I would tell him, you have to go to the hospital. He was 260 pounds. I couldn't put him in the car and take him to the hospital. So I would have to oftentimes try to give him options. Okay, we have option one and we have option two. Which one do you want to do? Because we have to do one of them. Sometimes that worked, you know. 
kind of almost like a child. You're always keeping a schedule, making sure that they get stuff done, and it reminds me sometimes of what I used to do with my kids when they were three, four, and five years old. And sometimes um, they rebel, and they're not happy. He is stubborn, and so I have to be, um, I have to raise my voice a little bit, you know, like, no, you can't do that, or whatever. I don't know. No, it just triggers in me feeling like I'm a... Yeah, there's something that triggers in him. ...little kid. Mm -hmm. Again, and my parent is, you know, mm -hmm. she's not my parent. You know? <laughs> she's never been my parent. They go through a lot of stuff, and you have to be able to be willing to say, no, they don't mean it. They're just not in their right mind. And... Uh, Work on it, work on it from there. I think it's fair to, to acknowledge that a lot of times the disease will create changes in the person. The person may not be acting in the way that they used to behave. And sometimes they may have confusion, which also changes the way they're able to process or interact. And I think for caregivers, it can be very confusing and maddening even. They think Sometimes they interpret that the person with the disease is doing this on, on purpose or being difficult or challenging or stubborn when in fact it's really the disease that is um, creating that behavior. We went through some things emotionally because the medication I think does a lot to the person that you're working with. And I didn't realize that at the time. I, I really didn't. I thought he was just being a jerk because he's, he's like, the most kind-hearted person ever and so to hear a harsh word come out of his mouth it, it sent me back about 10 feet every time. I think caregivers have to recognize and, and acknowledge when they're confused or when they're ambiguous about how to interpret the person's behavior and then as open as they can possibly be with the patient as well as the larger family or social support system they really need to communicate that the behavior may be different and that we have to interpret it in light of the disease and its effects. You tell them you, you have liver disease. I mean, you can see it in their face. It's like they write you off. It's like, um, okay, you were a drug addict or you've had other problems that you caused this to yourself. The cause of Mary's uh, Cirrhosis is unknown. I mean, she was not a drinker, she did not take drugs, but you still have the, uh, oh, cirrhosis, well, you must have been an alcoholic. Everything changed. I mean, when you talk about your community, they disappeared completely. You know, we have each, out of all the friends that we had when we were, you know, healthy, quote unquote healthy, three who we still see. You'll have friends that'll say, well, I, you know what, well, if you need anything, let me know. Well, you learn that that's a really not true, okay? You know, you hear that a lot, you know, if you need anything, you know, or I'll be over to see you. Or some people in your family just, they won't be around, <laughs> you know, and you get used to it. Don't dwell on it too much. You're pretty much on your own with your caregiver. We did have house guests just two weeks ago, and they, and... It's amazing how he gets off track. And I finally had to say, oh, I'm sorry, he just can't go out to eat again. <laughs> We're gonna have to, we have to stay home today and you know, follow his diet. And it just gets, it just gets out of control. A lot of, a lot of times relatives, friends don't understand. Another thing that relatives do is say, can't you do something about this? Can't you tell his doctors, yeah. do something about this? Every appointment we have, yes, we discuss it, and there's not really too much you can do about encephalopathy. Problems with extended family and even with friends, uh, neighbors can arise. Caregivers are sometimes challenged or questioned about what they're doing or not doing. It, it can be very difficult and demoralizing for the primary caregiver when others around them um, challenge them or uh, suggest that they do things differently or uh, 
perhaps insinuate that they're not doing as complete a job. Sometimes I feel bad. I feel like they sort of blame me that I'm not taking good enough care of him. That is a reality in caregiving. People have a lot of ideas and they, they don't always have all the information or the day-to-day -day experiences of the, the primary caregiver. And so I think it's important to figure out some mechanisms that can help manage that as well. And, and certainly, if nothing else, to know that it's a common occurrence. There's been some relationship strains since his hospital stay because I didn't call the right people at the right time but I also didn't know that I should call them, you know, or I assumed that I'd talk to one and they could pass the information on. And uh, sometimes that communication piece was missing. I created a page by invitation only on Facebook. Once a day during all this stuff, I would say what happened. What I had arranged ahead of time was uh, one point of contact on my side of the family and one point of contact on my wife's side of the family. That helped uh, reduce how many times you are filling people in. They would communicate the information to the rest of the family. My brothers and sisters um, live in Philadelphia. So I set up the first time a text that I, you know, like I would go back to and I would tell them all at once. You're going to have to learn that you're not in this alone. And if you're in it alone, don't be. Ask for help. I believe you should have a couple primary backup people to yourself, um, people that you can count on. You can't always count on a family member. I, I firmly recommend reach out to people that you know will be there when it matters. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a neighbor. To seek out other people and to try to trust them. It's, it's difficult. I mean, it very much is. I mean, not recently, but it, there's in the past where I, she's planned something and, and I went somewhere and it didn't work out, you know, and she's stuck somewhere and she's like, she was there for two hours, you know, and nobody was around and I'm like, okay, that ain't happening again. Have one more layer to reach out to in an emergency situation that you can go to. You may never have to go there, but figuring it out at that time is not the right time to figure it out. Figuring out ahead of time and sticking with your plan is, is my uh, approach. I think my family was concerned about me with two, and only when he came into an emergency one time. My brother happened to be here in Michigan. He came and got my mom. And he kept my mom until my brother went into emergency and had surgery. So um, I did have plan B sort of the back of my head. So my mom's now in assisted living, which is still hard. My son was also sick during that time. And so I had actually on the same day a husband and a son both in the ER on separate sides of the hospital. It was the work-life balance on steroids. We thought we had gathered a support group that was going to be there for us, actually in the home, because they were gonna stay here to help so I could go to work and I could deal with my son, and that didn't work out so well. So I always tell everybody, you have to remember the F word. It's flexible. You have to be able to be flexible. Otherwise, you're not gonna get anywhere. I was fortunate. I actually ran out of paid time off during this, and they found time out of the sick bank, so I was able to get paid for the entire time that he was off. And just by asking, you know, my boss was, was very understanding. At a moment's notice, I would pick up the phone, I'd say, I gotta go, or I'm, I'm in the hospital. So I think as long as those people who are in your life every day, who you work with, both, you know, both home and school, I think if you take the time to explain to them and let them know, people are, willing to be flexible. Get yourself a nice big thick pad. When you go to her home, before you leave there, leave a paragraph and a page. The next one that walks in can open up the book and go, oh, look what you did, or look what they did, or look how they did it. Because number one, if you got that many caregivers, and you're not all under the same roof at exactly the same time, and if you was under the roof at the same time, somebody's gonna forget something.
When managing the uh, medication schedule, I think it's helpful to create some kind of chart, write down all the medications, what time of the day you have to take them, and what, what amount of that medication you have to take, and literally use that as a checklist. That will eliminate forgetting to take the medications. It'll eliminate not taking them at the appropriate schedule. We're, we're a big electronic family. Technology is a big thing. So he has his alarm set on his phone to take his medication. I have cell phone and I have my alarm set on my phone for him to take his and I'll call him to take a medicine today. I'm taking it right now. Nope, nope, I forgot. And I'll stand with him on the phone until he takes his medication. So we're coordinating with the cell phones. This is his schedule. This is what he has to take. Sometimes Richard will forget what was said. And uh, I can't sit there and write and try to ask her a question at the same time, so I decided that I was going to bring a little tape recorder in. It has one of the flash drives that you just plug into your computer and goes on the computer and then he can listen to it again. I'm driven by my faith in God. So uh, I don't believe God's going to give me anything in life I can't handle. Everything that we're talking about, one's kind of nuts and bolts. Right. You know, what you do to do these things, right. the, the, what A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But why do you do those things? Because right. of belief in a higher power that's going to get me through the day. And that belief is what gives me peace. We like to laugh. I've laughed so many times the last few years that tears would come down your face. But when I got done, I felt great. People might not think it's so funny when we're in a doctor's office or whatever and making a joke, but I think that is what's got us through a lot of it, is the sense of humor. We have been in the hospital rooms, and, and I'm telling you the truth, where I have looked at Debbie and said, shut the door because they're going to kick everybody out because of the <laughs> laughing so loud. I have a friend who I said something to one day, and she says, Donna, you don't have a life yet. And I said, you know what, I don't. So uh, it'll come, <laughs> it'll and it's come coming. You know, it's coming back. And so I think you just got to know it's a time thing that you're dealing with. After the liver started working and the neuropathy lessened naturally with the liver working, and we would go to doctor's appointments, and I had been used to a full year of answering <laughs> questions, and all of a sudden I got looked at like, are you going to shut up? And I went, why, yes, I am. I, you know, I just, you know, I mean, like, it was like, it was like passing the baton back. Well, here. Know your patient. You start giving back control and then you have to give them, not even give them, make them take some so they have self-worth. I actively say, okay, you can't control this part anymore. You know, it's almost like as a child grows up, it's almost like that, but it happens a lot faster. He's really an easy case to deal with, but I am learning to let it go. She's turned herself around and uh, it's amazing what what she went through and what she can do now. It's just unbelievable. He's doing better now than he has been, and you know, we're thankful for that, so. I stayed out of the hospital for almost two years. I mean, yeah. you know, you can't ask for much more than that. He's doing everything he can to, to repair, do the repair work he needs to do. And maybe someday I can go back to being a wife instead of a caregiver, you know, because it's difficult to be both.